We've had the opportunity to be talking the last couple of weeks about the humility of Jesus and what that means for us. As we've come together and have celebrated what Christmas is all about, I've been reminded of who Jesus is and what he gave up to come. And there's something for each and every one of us to talk about this idea of the humility of Jesus and what that really means. And I was reminded uh, because I was asked this question earlier, what does humility really mean? You know, that's kind of a hard thing to describe, what it means to be humble. Being humble before someone is to lower ourselves, to think of someone else more than ourselves. Being humble is to submit ourselves to someone and their authority, knowing that they have uh, the authority over us. Submitting ourselves and humbling ourselves before God. You know, what we've done over the past couple of weeks is have a couple of different pictures of what this humility really looks like. When we looked at Jesus, when he washed the disciples' feet and how he gave them an example of serving one another and why it was so important for him to do that, to serve his disciples, that they may really understand what he was done, what he was doing on the brink of his giving of his life and sacrificing. We've talked about this idea of what it really means to humble ourselves and to give things up as he told his disciples and talked with the rich young ruler, the rich young man who had everything and asked what it meant to be, what he had to do to be saved and He said he had to, Jesus said he had to give everything, and the man was not willing to do that. Jesus also went on and said, talked about those that were the greatest, those that were the least, and the difference between those two, and what it means to be humble. We also looked last week at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and how he humbled himself before God ultimately. And the agonizing moment in that prayer when he prayed, asking God to take this cup from me, but not my will. Your will be done. And we talked about that in the humility of that moment of Jesus taking upon the wrath of God. The punishment of your sin and my sin upon himself. The great pictures that we have in scripture that talk about Jesus and his humility and what he did for us. What he gave up to come for each and every one of us. And we come to Christmas. Christmas is a wonderful story of the birth of Jesus. It's a wonderful picture given to us about how Jesus gave up all of heaven and the glory and the presence of God to come in the form of a baby and to be born. As we were reminded in the video of the passage in Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul talking about Jesus giving up everything that he had, taking on the form of a servant to come and be obedient to death, that picture of humility. But you see, the problem is sometimes humility is messy because if we're going to humble ourselves before someone else, that means that we make ourselves vulnerable. We allow ourselves to come under the authority of someone else. We allow ourselves to to be at the beck and call of someone else as we humble ourselves in the form of a servant. That's messy for us. And it's also messy for Jesus. And what a great picture in the video of the messiness, if that's the correct word, of the birth of Jesus and how Jesus gave up everything to come. And the amazing thing about it, in in all of that mess, because I know you've probably been around barns. Barns aren't the best smelling places in the world. They're not the cleanest places in the world. They're not the greatest places to hang out in the world unless you really love animals and God calls you to do that and thank the Lord he's called some because he didn't call me to do that. But even in the midst of all that, we still see a beautiful picture of life, Jesus being born as a baby to come onto this earth. And how could something so beautiful be so messy? Yes, the location was messy, but there's more to this picture. There's two things that I want to share with you this morning, this idea of Jesus' humility. And the first one is, what is messy about Jesus' humility? Because when we think about it, this baby being born, this beautiful baby, yes, it was in a stable, but the bigger picture is what's messy about Jesus' humility is his sacrifice. What's messy about Jesus' humility is his sacrifice. Not just the fact that he was born, but what happened after his birth. He lived his life to show us and to teach us to be an example of God's love for us. And also in the humility of his sacrifice and what he did for each and every one of us. 
There's a great passage of Scripture of the promise of the Messiah that talks about the messiness of his sacrifice. If you've got your Bible or your apps, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. This is a great story that the prophet Isaiah gives us of what God has placed upon his heart to show us and to tell us about the coming Messiah, of what it would really be for this Messiah, the Savior of the Israelites to come. But they didn't know the full plan of God's messy plan for each and every one of us. Isaiah chapter 51, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied, and by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. You see, what the prophet Isaiah gives us is a picture of the messy plan of God to redeem each and every one of us. You see, humility is messy. Because when you think about it, Jesus gave up everything, not to live a lustrous life as the King of kings and Lord of lords on this earth, but he came to be humbly a servant to each and every one of us, knowing that God's plan was to lead him to the cross and to death and to suffering and to pain and to affliction and to anxiety. And all of these things that the prophet Isaiah gives us, this picture of our Messiah, our Savior, it's interesting what, my, what Isaiah has told us. You see, he tells us that this Messiah is going to come and not be something that's going to attract our attention. In verse 2, he talks about the fact that no beauty or majesty will be upon him. Nothing in his appearance is something that will grab our attention. You see, there's a lot of things today, church, that grab our attention. There's a lot of people that grab our attention. There's a lot of things in this world that grab our attention, our focus. But that wasn't the case with the Messiah. You would think that the Son of God would bring a little bit of attention to himself. But yet he came humbly in the messiness of a barn, a stable, a manger, a trough to be born. Isaiah says he will come with nothing that will attract beauty upon himself, but he will come with the purpose of being despised, of being rejected, of having pain and affliction upon himself. This was the chosen Messiah that was to save Israel and all its people. This was the promise. But yet Isaiah tells us this is the picture of the promise. And it's messy. Isaiah also tells us that in the midst of all this suffering and pain and misery, in verse 11, he talks about the fact of what's going to happen after his suffering. 
that it's messy because of the suffering, but through the suffering, there's going to come glory. For you see in verse 11, he says, he will see the light of life and be satisfied and his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. You see, where's the glory in the messiness of sinfulness, in the messiness of death, in the messiness of pain? But you see, it's, we have to understand that the prophet is saying that those people, we will be justified not by what we do, but by what the Messiah will do. For you see, what he did is he substituted in our place for our sinfulness, the wrath of God that came upon him. As we shared last week, Jesus was sinless. There was no sin. He did not sin, so therefore he was not capable of of doing something that would be worthy of this type of punishment. But yet, he took upon the wrath of God the punishment of our sin, the iniquities of us all so that we could experience life. This is the messiness of his sacrifice and he didn't have to do this, but he knew that he was the only way for us, you and I, to experience salvation because Jesus even says in John fourteen six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, only through Jesus. Nothing we can do, nothing we can do will bring us this gift of salvation except through Jesus. And that's what makes his sacrifice so messy. Because if you imagine the most beautifully wrapped present that was waiting for you under that Christmas tree. I know many of us may have presents under the tree. We may have things. We may even know everything we're going to get. But they're going to be beautifully wrapped and they're going to be waiting for us, anticipating us wrapping. Well, some of us tear open the paper. Some of us carefully untape the paper. And take forever to unwrap. You know who you are. But imagine anticipating opening that gift. You see that beautiful present that is awaiting many of us. It's hard to compare that picture with this picture. But it's part of God's plan and that's the amazing thing about it. So if this is the picture that the prophet Isaiah gave us of the Messiah, this messiness of Jesus' sacrifice, of his humility, if we are to follow in Jesus' example, if we're to be just like him, what does our humility look like? If this is what Jesus' humility looks like, what does our humility look like? And again, humility is humbling ourselves before God, humbling ourselves before someone else to be able to experience all that God wants to pour into our lives. What does it look like for us? Because Scripture teaches us that Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, you must deny yourself Take up your cross and follow me in Luke chapter 9. Jesus said, this is what it's going to take to be my example, to follow me. So if Jesus humbled himself, what does it look like? What is messy about our humility? Well, it's what this verse said. It's about our self-denial because we don't like to do that. Church, we don't like to do that, to deny ourselves the things that we like, the things that we've worked for, the things that we feel like we need to have, the things that we feel we're entitled to. We don't like to deny those things. But yet, in the messiness of all of this, there's a sense that we have to deny ourselves in order to receive all that God wants to give for us. There's three things that I want to share with you about this self-denial that we have that can be messy for some of us. The first one or the first part of this self-denial is salvation. Well, what's messy about that? Well, because Jesus died on the cross for my sin, that's what enabled me to have salvation. And I have to understand that that was because of his sacrifice, because he substituted himself in my place, because I'm the one that deserved to die. I'm the one that deserves to be separated from God. It was my sin, my iniquity, as scripture teaches us, that placed him on the cross. But Jesus said, no, I'm sacrificing myself. I'm humbling myself so that he and all may experience salvation. The salvation that comes to us through Jesus Christ, through accepting what he has done for us. The fact that in salvation we're saved from our sin. We're saved away from those sinful habits and choices that we make. That scripture teaches us in Romans 10, 9 and 10 that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, then we will be saved. 
You see, the amazing thing about it is that we have been given salvation, but we cannot receive salvation unless we accept that, unless we deny ourselves, unless we follow in Jesus' footsteps to be able to say that he has done something for us. Another part of this self-denial is the indwelling. Well, what does that mean, indwelling? It means something dwelling within you, something that comes into you. One of the greatest things that I have in talking with children or anybody is the fact that they grasp the understanding that when they ask Jesus to save them, they're asking Jesus to come into your heart so that when I ask that question, well, where is Jesus now? They can say, he's in my heart. You see, that's the wonderful thing about the indwelling of Jesus. Because you see, in order for Jesus to come into our heart, we have to deny ourselves and give up everything that we have. Because we cannot continue in our sinfulness. Church, we can't continue in our sinfulness and expect Jesus to come in and to be residing, to live, and to give us this life that he has given us through his death, burial, and resurrection. We can't expect that. Why? Because God cannot be in the presence of sin. So in order for us to experience the messiness of our humility before God is we have to say, God, you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sins and I'm asking Jesus to come in to indwell in my life. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 7 and 9, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. You see, what we have to understand is the part of this self-denial, the messiness of having to deny ourselves before God, is that we allow God to come into us, that Christ now comes a part of us, that Christ brings us This life that he has promised us through the prophet Isaiah and the Messiah that was going to come. That the glory of all this new life that he was going to give us is fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And it's completed in us when we ask Jesus to come into our heart. Paul goes on and says in Romans 8 verse 10. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the spirit, but by the spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. You see, the amazing thing about Christ living in us is now Christ helps us to live the way that we're supposed to. And this leads us to the third point, the transformation that happens. You see, when we come to that point and deny ourselves, and as difficult as that is, this is the thing that the prophet Isaiah said when he said, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life. And the thing that happens in us when we allow Christ to come into our heart, knowing that he died for our sins and wanting to invite him into our heart, then we know that he's going to do something within us to transform us into that new life that he has given us. There will be a change that happens in our life. For all of us, every single one of us who have asked Jesus to come into our heart, if we've received the gift of salvation that Jesus has given us, then you and I are able to experience a change in our life. Why? Because through suffering, there is vindication. Now, what do you mean by that, Paul? That means when we suffer something, usually we're better people because of it. Because when Christ suffered, he suffered for a purpose, and that was so that he may die in our place and give us new life. When we go through times of suffering... If we have the faith in Jesus Christ and God being in control of all things, when we've walked through that, we're able to look back and to see that it's like that picture that's painted for us, that there's a a set of footprints in the sand, and that's Jesus carrying us through those difficult times. Or it may be that you know God is going to work things out. Even though it's not according to your plan, you know that he's going to work things out. You see, sometimes when we go through suffering, we have the hope of what Jesus has given us. Let me tell you, church... All I have to do is remember how sinful I am and the sins that God has already revealed to me that I've asked Jesus to forgive me because I know that he died on the cross for those sins that I don't have to live under bondage of them anymore. 
You see, there will be a day, a glorious day, where I don't have to worry about this body and all of the earthly sinful things that go on in this body because I know, as the Scripture teaches me, there will be a glorious day where I will have a new body and praise the Lord, it's not going to look like this. But I will have a new body in the presence of God and that's what gives me joy. That's why when I sing about Christmas, when I'm reminded of the birth of Jesus, I'm also reminded about the messy fact that God's plan was for him to die so that I might have life. You see, that's the transformation that God can do in your life. In Romans chapter 8, verse 16, it says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. There's a great pastor friend of mine in our association. And let me tell you, when he gets excited, some of you that were here at our associational meeting, he's known for saying, glory, glory, glory. And I love it when he gets excited because for one, he wakes everybody up like I just did. But two, it's an amazing thing because he reminds me of the glory of God in all of his beauty and amazement. And folks, that's what I see in Christmas, in the birth of our Savior. But I also see it in the messiness of the plan of God for each and every one of us. That you see in Jesus' sacrifice, his humility, it was messy because he gave of himself for you and I to die for our sin. So that we might be transformed and have life. That through the messiness of us having to give of ourselves. To give up all that we have. Like the rich young man. To to give everything that we relied upon. To have faith in Christ. To give up all the wants and desires of our life. To give up all the secret sins in our life. To give up all the things that brings us comfort. You see, that's the transformation that happens. And that's the messy part of self-denial. But when we do that, church, when we do that, then we will be able to adore our God like never before. And the question today is, have you done that? Have you done that in your life? Have you trusted in the messy plan that God has for you? Because sin is messy. Sin is messy. There's no way to get around it. And if we're going to continue to live in that messiness, that's why Jesus came as the great shepherd into our messiness to die for us so that we might have new life. And you see, when we every day submit ourselves to God, it's messy, it's hard, it's painful sometimes. But when we do, when we do, that's when we experience the glory of God and all of his fullness is then given to us because Jesus lives in our heart. Have you asked Jesus to be your savior? I close with this, my favorite verse, Colossians 2, 6. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in, and strengthened in faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. You see, think about this. When Jesus was born, He was born to live His life and to die. So you and I might live in Him and have all that we need to make it in life. Have you asked Jesus to be your Savior? Have you asked Jesus into your life? Have you accepted the gift of salvation? If not, deny your pride, deny your fear, deny what you think other people are going to say, and step out and follow Jesus. Because Jesus was humbled, and you and I are humbled to receive his salvation. Let's pray.